hope everybody's been having a good time in our uh, Hack the Box University CTF for 2022. Uh, in this talk, we'll be talking about how to get into binary exploitation. And um, when we talk about binary exploitation, we have to first understand what it is and where we can use it. Uh, taking a look at our recent Hack the Box certificates, uh, CPTS and CBBH, we rarely cover the binary exploitation. And this is because we think when we are talking about basic penetration testing and web application penetration testing, you are unlikely to to need to do binary exploitation due to the to the to the nature of, of those uh, tests of those pen tests. But once you get into more advanced uh, pen testing or senior pen testing or or especially red teaming, then binary exploitation becomes unavoidable and it becomes quite an important asset. Uh, for for a pen tester, especially uh, once they get a little bit more advanced, uh, those who want to develop uh, exploits and and identify vulnerabilities for uh, operating systems, for binaries and and programs, then binary uh, binary exploitation is 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 a must. So, what is binary exploitation? Uh, if we go into the buffer overflows and windows module on Actor Box Academy, uh, it gives us a very brief introduction uh, about binary exploitation and says. Our primary goal with binary exploitation is to subvert the binary's execution of its, you know, instructions in memory, subvert them in a way that benefits us as 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 attackers. So we have user input. We want to use that input, whatever it is, to subvert the way the binary is intended to execute its instructions in a way that benefits us. For example, to get to get extra input into the binary, or maybe even get remote code execution or a Linux shell. Uh, there are many examples of binary exploitation. Uh, probably the most common one is buffer overflows, but we also have things like format strings and we have things like uh, heap exploitation, which is the most common thing we find in uh, modern binary uh, attacks on, on operating systems and, and even uh, advanced binaries. And if we want to get into some historical examples of uh, buffer overflows or binary uh, exploitation in general, this module also gives us some some fun snippets about uh, about some historical examples of buffer overflows. Uh, for example, in 2010, uh, iPhones running iOS 4 were jailbroken using the Green Poison jailbreak, uh, if you remember that, if you were around that time, uh, and that used a buffer overflow found on iOS. Of course, later on, iOS introduced some memory protections, which made it much more difficult to attack such a, 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 a an overflow. But back then, it was possible, and it would also give you uh, code execution on the on the kernel itself, which which is the highest level you can get. Another example was a stack-based buffer overflow exploit on the original PlayStation Portable, the PSP running firmware 2.0, and this uh, vulnerability allowed us to gain unrestricted access to the to the core kernel of the PSP and basically execute whatever code we want, which basically people use to to make a jailbreak for the PSP and uh, you know allow them to install uh, you know uh, unlicensed software like games and so on. And uh, there was later on. Uh, another uh, another similar vulnerability was found in how some of the games like Grand, Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories uh, was loading uh, the load files, and this also led to a buffer overflow, which was also utilized to gain unrestricted remote code execution. Uh, we have so many so many examples just for stack based buffer overflows for this module. Obviously, we can go through them like like the one uh, the Twilight hack uh, that was found in the Legend of Zelda, uh, the Legend of Zelda, which also gave. Uh, unrestricted kernel level access on the Nintendo Nintendo Wii, and we we also give you know a few a few other examples. <laughs> Very recently, just a couple of years ago, a stack based buffer overflow vulnerability was found on the PlayStation Two. When people now these days they have the ability to review the code and and, and you know view the source code of the uh, PlayStation Two DVD player, and they are actually identified a a vulnerability, which was the the uh, fun fact the very first software based. Uh, unrestricted code access on the uh, code execution on the PlayStation 2. All of the vulnerabilities that were found back in the day for PlayStation 2 were actually hardware-based. You have to input like a, a, a memory stick or, uh, and something or do some hardware exploitation. So this gives us an overview of what binary exploitation and, and basically a buffer overflows, how they can look like and how can they can be utilized. Most of these examples are obviously uh, quite old because buffer overflows is no longer uh, a very common vulnerability that you would find because there are many protections against it. But learning it 
uh, is very useful to learn binary, ex binary exploitation. And this module actually even shows us some, some examples of how we can, uh, you know, pop stuff into, into the stack or push them. And, and even how, if we, you know, insert a very long string, how it would, you know, overflow the stack and, you know, overwrite uh, stuff in the stack and, you know, write the EBB, EIP. But what is the stack? Uh, what is ESP? What is EIP? And what is overwriting uh, the stack and overflowing it? That's why we always recommend that we want, when we want to get into binary exploitation, we do not directly hop into buffer overflows, even though we, we may be able to watch a video and understand how it's working and maybe even, you know, write a, a, an exploit to do this, uh, to do this buffer overflow. But once we start getting into a little bit more advanced stuff, uh, we, we pass the buffer overflows, we want to get into more advanced buffer overflows, for example, with some protections, or we want to do rob chains, or we want to do um, advanced heap exploitation or OS exploitation, then we would not be able to understand all of that just by understanding each topic on its own. We have to start all of that by understanding, by having a solid foundation and understanding of the computer architecture and the assembly language that wraps it all. Which is why you see in our introduction to binary exploitation uh, skill path on Hackerbox Academy, we recommend going into uh, the assembly language module first. And this is what we will be covering next in this talk. So let's hop on to the assembly, intro to assembly uh, language module and see what we can learn. So what is assembly language? Uh, assembly language is, is the lowest level language that we humans can write to interact with the processors. We basically write a, a, a program to directly interact with the, with the processor level instructions, which can be a very tedious task, obviously, but since it is the lowest possible, it gives us the greatest access to the processor and uh, the greatest ability to be able to interact with the processor. If we want to see how higher level languages translate into the, the assembly language and lower lang level languages, we can see this example that's shown in the intro to assembly uh, module. Uh, if we start with something like print, hello world, and, and, and Python, it would basically just, uh, just print a, 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 a hello world string. But what does this actually do uh, when it comes to the processor and the memory? Python uses compiled C libraries, which basically uh, would end up doing a write, uh, a write instruction in C, write one, which is uh, the output, and then the string that we want, hello world, and then the length of the string, and then it would just exit gracefully from the from the program. Uh, we give the reference uh, right about here on wh where you can find this. Uh, in the Python open source, uh, where this write and exit, you would find how it would be linked to print. But basically, this is what it does. It, it uses the write uh, syscall on C level language. And once C is compiled, uh, for Python, it's obviously pre-compiled, it would actually be using these assembly instructions. Uh, this bit is for the write, and this bit down here is the syscall for exit. So basically it is doing these assembly instructions to write something to the screen and then these assembly instructions to exit the program. Uh, and this is the, the lowest level we can interact with the, with the processor. We are telling the processor to execute the move instruction and it puts one into RAX. And if this is obviously the processor does not understand the English language, does not understand what move is, it gets actually translated into hex and binary. So 48 would, the processor would understand it as move. And then C7, C0 would understand it as Rx, and then 1, it would understand it as, as 1, obviously. And it would say, uh, it would understand to move 1 into Rax using the move instruction. And this, obviously, the, the, the processor at, at its core does not, in, in, the, in the silicon, does not understand hex. It understands binary, only 1s and zeros as electric signals. So we would give it 48 as binary, and then C7, C0, and binary, and then 1. And it would actually be able to translate all of that and execute the move instruction. Now, by the end of the module, obviously, this would be very easy to understand. Uh, this is a quite basic syscall, uh, but this gives us an idea of how the processor understands this, this print world uh, instruction or, 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 uh, or call in, in Python line of code and how it actually gets into executing it. Now, if we keep going into this section, we see, once again, uh, the section mentions the value of of learning assembly and learning the computer architecture for us as pen testers. And just to reiterate, uh, having the ability to understand assembly code gives us 
great advantage in being able to disassemble, debug, and follow the binary the the binary instruction uh, execution in memory and see how it goes and which would allow us to basically reverse engineer some binaries and even uh, identify some vulnerabilities. And even if we had access open uh, had access to the open source of the of the program that we want to debug and we find a vulnerability in the source code itself, to be able to to uh, to develop an exploit for that, we still need to to learn and understand the how the instructions are happening in memory so that we can interfere with the memory execution of instructions and you know input properly input our our you know uh, malicious input right into and inject it right into memory so going into the next section we see that this section covers computer architecture the very first uh, paragraph here is a very brief summary of a book called the innovators by Walter Isaacson uh, which is the author best known for his autobiography of Steve Jobs and this is a very fun read. I really recommend reading it if you want to understand and and uh, and learn how computers got to where they are today from the very basics and early day of, of computers in the 1850s. But what we want to know and understand is the von Neumann architecture, which is the architecture most of modern computers today, and perhaps all of them, are based on. And this architecture was developed to enable the, the general purpose computer uh, principle that was proposed and later on even achieved by Alan Turing himself. And using the von Neumann architecture and Alan Turing's uh, proposal was all built on, on the works of uh, Charles Babbage in the 1850s, like, like I mentioned. And Charles Babbage, Charles Babbage uh, actually uh, proposed the, the, the concept of being able to create machines that automatically calculate some calculations so we don't have to do them uh, on our own. So it would automatically, without any human interference, uh, take an algorithm that we can program and it would actually execute it and, and yield the result. And Charles Babbage did not actually get into applying this uh, this proposal, but his student, uh, Ada Lovelace, actually was the very first programmer identified today. She was able to write an algorithm using Charles Babbage's uh, proposal and get it to actually execute automatically and yield the result. So our main takeaway of this is the von Neumann architecture, which runs most of uh, modern computers today. So in a very simplistic uh, view of the von Neumann architecture, we have a central processing unit, and on one side we have a short-term memory, like cache or, or the RAM, and on the other side we have the I.O., like the keyboard, display, or even the long-term storage. The CPU itself has the CU, which is the control unit, and the ALU, which is the uh, arithmetic logic unit, and finally it has some registers. We will get into all of that in a bit. But this is basically the, the von Neumann architecture, which, as we, as you can tell, runs most of modern computers. We know about, you know, RAM and cache and CPUs, and we know about, you know, long-term storage like SSD and HDD and displays and keyboard, which is basically the the modern computer architecture. The section afterwards gets into more details about the memory, the I/O, and and all of their components. We will not have time to get into details, but let's take a look at them. We ha first of all have the memory, which, as we discussed, uh, have two examples, which are the cache and the random access memory. The cache being the closest to the CPU, it is the smallest. So we have the level one cache, the, the fastest kind of caches, but it is only in kilobytes in size because it lies on each CPU core. So if we have eight cores, we have eight level one caches. Then we have the level two cache, which is shared by all cores, but it lies right within the CPU itself, and it makes it the second fastest after the, the caches. And obviously we have something that is faster than the caches, which is the registers, but they are very small in size, just bytes. And level two caches are in megabytes. Also some, some processors may also have the level three caches, and they are also in megabytes, a little bit slower than, than level two caches. Next, we have the RAM, and the RAM is much larger in size than the caches, and for that, it cannot lie directly on the CPU itself. Uh, the RAM can be in gigabytes in size or even terabytes in size to be able to handle all of the live data about any running application. And if we have things like games or data processing AI applications, they can have uh, very large data sets, data assets, which can uh, be stored in the RAM. And the central processing unit can be able to very quickly interact with the RAM to be able to pull those data and process them and then store them back, which is why it needs to be very fast but it cannot lie within the, the CPU itself because it, it, it needs to be very large. This is why it is much larger, but also it is much slower than the cache, uh, the cache memory. We have four main segments uh, split into the RAM, the stack, the heap, the data, 
and the text. Each of those has its own use, and the 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 uh, section goes into details of how what each of those are used for and how it works. Uh, the heap flows upwards and the stack downwards, as we can see. Then we have the I/O storage, and the main thing we want to understand about those is that they connect to the CPU through what is known as bus interfaces, which are those tiny lines we can see in in, in any motherboard when we take a look at the green or blue motherboard we see tiny lines running from the cpu to any uh, any external ports like the hdmi or or even the ram or any other ports and those actually allow data to flow between the cpu the ram and and those uh, io devices uh, which allows us to be able to send data from the cpu to to the display or even store them in the long term storage those vary in size uh, and they can be in multiples of 4 bits and you know this size basically allows us to uh, the, the bigger it is, the larger amounts of data we can send and the, and the faster it can get. So this gives us a quick look into modern computers uh, architecture based on the von Neumann architecture as we discussed earlier. So to wrap it all up, uh, the closer we get to the CPU, the faster units we have. So the fastest are the registers, which are only bytes in size. Then we have the level one caches, which are the fastest apart from the registers, and they are kilobytes in size. Then we have level two and level three caches, which caches which are megabytes in size, and they are also very fast. Then we have RAMs, which are gigabytes and terabytes in size, which are fast, but still much slower than the caches. And the, the slowest we have is the long-term storage. Even though the, the modern M2 uh, SSD drives are much faster than the, the old HDD drives, which were rotating to access data, but they are still much slower than the RAM and the caches. Now that we have a basic understanding of computer architecture, let's take a look at the CPU architecture and how it works. We mentioned earlier that we have this control unit, the CU, and the uh, arithmetic logic unit, the ARU. Uh, so we often hear terms like uh, this CPU has a speed of 3.0 gigahertz. And that means that this CPU can run 3 billion clock cycles every second, 3 billion hertz. And what that means is that each core in the CPU, so if we have a core, a, an eight core CPU, it can run eight times three billion clock cycles every second, 24 billion clock cycles every second. But what does a clock cycle mean? We can think about it as a tick tock happening within the CPU. So we have tick tock, tick tock, and each one of those can run one thing at most uh, by the CPU. And running instructions, assembly instructions by the CPU happens in what's known as the instruction cycle, which happens in a fetch, decode, execute, and store cycle. So we start by fetching the address of the next instruction to be executed by the CPU. So what do we want to execute next? Once the processor gets to that address, it decodes what is stored there and understands what the user wants us to do. And then it actually executes this instruction, and finally it stores the result with wherever the, the assembly instruction uh, instructed it to do. If we take a look at this diagram, it shows us how can this happen uh, within the clock cycle. For example, it may take two clock cycles to fetch the, uh, the address of the next instruction, depending on where it's stored. Maybe it's in RAM, it will take a little bit, a bit longer than if it was in cache or in a register. And then it may only take like a single cycle to decode it, and then it may take like two to three cycles to execute this instruction or even more. Now, modern uh, processors do not do that in a sequential manner, but actually they do it in a in a parallel manner. Uh, maybe it fetches the first instruction, and then as it decoded as it's decoding the first instruction, it fetches the second instruction, and so on and so forth. Now, this may create some dependency issues, which is uh, solved by what is known as the branching prediction algorithm, which is quite complicated, but basically it prevents the uh, the cycle from being in a cyclical manner where it is trying to decode something, but it has not been fetched yet. It is a little bit uh, complicated and out of the scope of this talk and the module, but that gives us a basic idea of how instructions are executed in parallel. And this gives us a basic idea of how the CPU architecture works. Finally, let's wrap this talk up by understanding the assembly language of each processor which is known as the instruction set architecture. Each processor understands a different ISA, an instruction set architecture. And this basically is the assembly language it understands in binary. Uh, the ISA specifies the syntax and semantics 
of the assembly language this processor understands. And it specifies the type of instructions it can handle, the types of registers it utilizes, uh, what kind of memory addresses it uses, and the data types it can understand, uh, like the byte or double word and so on. And you know the, 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 the module in the section goes into more details about that. But the main thing we want to understand is that today we have two common ISAs, the CISC architecture and the RISC architecture. The CISC architecture, or Complex Instruction Set Computer, is most commonly known for Intel and AMD processors today. And the RISC architecture, the Reduced Instruction Set Computer, is most commonly known for ARM and, and more recently the Apple M1 processors. The CISC architecture prefers complex instructions, which means it prefers to store complex instructions right within the silicon itself so they can be executed by a single assembly line or a single uh, instruction cycle. And this allows the, the, uh, the, the processor itself to write down to the silicon very complex instructions. And when we want to use any of them, if they are very, you know, very often frequently used, we can just use a single assembly instruction. Where on the other hand, the RISC architecture preferred only storing the most commonly used instructions, hence the reduced instruction set on the silicon itself. So only the, the mandatory ones are stored. And then we try to use those the uh, add and, and multiply and so on to create more complex instructions using assembly language or using the software, basically. And this allows RISC processors to execute any instruction using only one clock cycle, whereas the CISC processors will use usually more than one. And at the same time, the RISC processors would have a reduced instruction set of only about 200 supported instructions, whereas the CISC processors would have a huge variety of instructions that we can use uh, in our disposal. So if we take a look at comparing the CISC and RISC architecture at a clock cycle level, we, as we saw earlier, the CISC architecture may fetch something in two clock cycles and then it decodes it. Uh, and at the same time, it would start fetching the other. And some of those instructions may take two to three cycles. But when it comes to RISC, this can be very streamlined. Each one of them would take one clock cycle exactly, which allows it to easily predict what's going to happen next and when it's going to happen. Now, in the past, uh, having complex instructions written directly in the silicon allowed, allowed us to execute those complex instructions very fast because they were written directly in the silicon in a very efficient manner. Whereas if we want to write something uh, in software, it would be less efficient because we humans are not very efficient in writing code. But today with having uh, very advanced uh, abilities of writing code and very advanced AI written uh, assembly code, we can have very efficient uh, assembly code that runs very efficient software, which is starting to make RISC processors become much more efficient than CISC processors. And at the same time, because it is only taking one clock cycle per instruction, it is also much more energy efficient, which is why we are seeing uh, modern MacBooks using much less energy than you know the, their Intel counterparts. And at the same time, uh, the uh, iPhones or, or mobile phones that we use use much less energy to execute, uh, to execute applications when compared to modern laptops and computers. So this gives us a brief look into what the main differences between RISC and CISC are and what an ISA or the assembly language of each processor is and how it can make the difference between uh, what we see as ARM and or M1 processors versus the Intel and AMD processors and how that ISA or assembly language can make a difference. And with that, we can wrap up today's talk by hopefully having understood the CPU architecture and the different uh, ISAs between each CPUs and the general computer architecture and the assembly language underlying each of them. Now, you can go through the module and read each of those sections to get a general idea of what assembly language and computer architecture is. And then you can go through the entire module, which is quite, quite lengthy and full of details to understand the x86-64 assembly language and how you can write uh, assembly instructions and assembly language and understand the x86 uh, assembly language and architecture. And once you understand one assembly language, it becomes much easier to understand uh, other assembly languages, especially if you understand how assembly language works when it comes to processors and how the computer architecture works in general. And hopefully once you complete the intro to assembly module in Hackerbox Academy, you would get a very solid foundation of how assembly language runs and how programs use the modern computer architecture and the assembly language to execute their instructions. And this hopefully would sit you on a very solid foundation for binary exploitation greatness. Thank you everyone for taking the time to attend this talk and I hope it was entertaining and you had a thing or two to learn from this talk. Thanks everyone and see you next time.